Tonight's speaker is Jack Forster. Uh, Jack's from Medina. He was a corporal in the U.S. Marine Corps. He enlisted in 1967. He was sent to Vietnam, uh, where he was wounded in action in the Quezon Mountains in May of 1968 and continued to serve until June of 1970. So here's Jack. Well, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, what I'm wearing is my color guard uniform uh, for Rittman. Uh, I'm a member of the Marine Corps Color Guard, uh, the American Legion Color Guard, and the VFW and Medina Color Guard. So once every six weeks, each of those units serves a full day at Rittman uh, doing the honors for those that are being, uh, that are being buried. Uh, sometimes we have as few as five, sometimes we have as many as eight or ten. Uh, but it's a great time for us to the, uh, the camaraderie that we have there uh, is, is phenomenal, and it's a, a way to honor and send off our veterans. So that, I just wanted to share that with you. I'll remove my cover. And um, um, what I've got here is a, a presentation. Well, actually, there's about almost 300 slides here. It took me about eight months to put it together. What I was, uh, I applied for as the 50th commemoration of the Vietnam War with the Department of Defense. So uh, what that got me was uh, a, a master sergeant who came to the event, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, and he pinned, there's a, a special pin that the Department of Defense made for Vietnam veterans. It's, it's sort of a goldish copper color pin uh, to commemorate the Vietnam War. So we pinned over a thousand Vietnam vets. Uh, it was at the IX Center, uh, the, the piston-powered autorama show at the IX Center, which is the largest event the IX Center does. Over a four-day period, they have about 45 to 50,000 people come through. The IX Center every year gives me a booth for free and anything I need. So two years ago, almost three years ago now, um, they gave me a booth of about 70 feet by 100 feet. I had aisles that were 8 feet wide and almost 300 panels that were 30 inches wide uh, mounted uh, two up through there from the early days of Vietnam to the fall of Saigon. And I had a lot of panels on different veterans from the Vietnam War uh, in all branches of the military. And uh, so it was, it was something uh, that I enjoyed uh, doing. It was an opportunity to meet with a lot of people. And you're lucky I'm not presenting all 300 slides tonight. <laughs> I always thought this was an interesting photo. Um, it, it's called The Soldier Alone. And as a combat soldier, there may be many of you out there in the audience. You know, there's times that you you feel uh, that loneliness that you're out there, uh, especially when I do, would do observation posts or listening posts. When you do a listening post, what that is is a four-man team. You'd go in front of the lines about 100, 200 yards, and the four of you would set in at night listening for the Viet Cong movement, and with the radio you would click uh, as if, if, if there's any movement. Here's Vietnam. Uh, I think most everybody sort of knows where it sits. It's awful close to China, and we ran into some Chinese in the Vietnam War, uh, and Chinese and Russians were both supporting the North Vietnam. Uh, so to, to get into a few facts, um, there was over 9 million military personnel that served on active dirty, duty during the Vietnam War from 1964 to 1975. 2,700,000 Americans served in Vietnam. I think in 1968 we had pretty close to 500,000 soldiers in Vietnam. Um, Vietnam, another fact was uh, the average combat soldier uh, that was in actual combat spent actually four and a half days in combat on average per week. Uh, so the intensity of the Vietnam War veteran was significantly more intense over a longer period of time um, than, than 
other prior wars. Uh, so Korea, uh, the World War II, World War I, they all had their intense battles. Um, and not to play that down any at all, uh, but there was relief time for those soldiers. In Vietnam, we did 13 months, there was no relief. Four and a half days of combat, week in, week out, on average. And there was many times I'd go week, week after week, uh, day after day uh, in combat. As you know, there was over 58,000 killed in Vietnam. The fall of Saigon happened in April uh, 30th, 1975. That was two years after the, uh, the U.S. troops uh, left Vietnam. Most people don't realize that they think Vietnam fell while the U.S. soldiers were there. Well, that's not true. The only thing that was there was the embassy. There was 140,000 evacuees as we were trying to get people that worked with uh, the, the U.S. military uh, out of the country. And those that we couldn't, a lot of those ended up in prisoner of war camps or killed. Um, and uh, so uh, then, then we look at 1968 and the Tet Offensive, and I'll talk a little bit about that because uh, I, was, I was in during the Tet Offense. Um, the Vietnam War, it, it was a struggle about communism, and the North wanted communism, the South wanted capitalism. Now, Ho Chi Minh, um, he actually was working with the OSS during World War II, but through lack of dip diplomatic uh, uh, policy from the U.S., he ended up moving over to communism. Um, and, and then his alignment came with Russia and China. Um, so the, uh, and you can see on the bottom right, that's the memorial to Ho Chi Minh. But it goes back to the early days of Ike. Uh, President Ike told Kennedy that don't get involved in Southeast Asia. He, Ike knew and warned President Kennedy. Well, President Kennedy made uh, his pledge to pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, uh, and oppose any foe. Uh, and, and what they were talking about was fighting communism. They didn't want the expansion of communism. With, the, with Korea going on, uh, Korea was, um, you know, it, it, fresh in everybody's mind. Uh, the, and the communism moved there and the growth of communism. I remember the days when we would hide under our desk as we did, you know, drills with bombing and everything. I'm sure we all remember that. A time where, you know, we were, we were really worried about communism. So what started the Vietnam War? Well, the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin was where we had two destroyers out there off in uh, international waters. And there was, a, there was a torpedo boat, uh, a small boat relatively, uh, that fired at uh, the, uh, one of the destroyers. I think it was called the Maddox, was the, destroy, was the destroyer. Well, he, he never hit the destroyer. He just fired at it. And uh, there was no competition between that, that boat and, and our destroyers. But it was the basis for starting the, world, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, and President Johnson took that uh, to Congress and, and was able to get Congress to act on it, which started the conflict in Vietnam. This is the face of Vietnam. Uh, this gives you a sense of the pictures. I've been through many rivers where the water was up to my neck, and as we got out of the rivers, we literally stripped and then did searches for leeches. And sometimes we'd have 30 or 50 leeches all over our bodies. Sometimes the jungles were so dense you couldn't get through them and you, and you had to go through the riverbeds. Um, so, you know, that, that's the kind of environment. We, we lived through monsoon. I got over in Vietnam during the monsoon season. It would rain day and night. You'd dig a foxhole and a few hours later it was a five foot deep foxhole would be filled with water when we'd get incoming rocket rounds or mortar rounds 
That swimming pool is where we went to, to get cover. 1965 is when the first protests started to occur. Um, you know, out in California, Oakland, Berkeley, um, we had the B-52s bombing and then Westmoreland. Uh, Westmoreland, you know, in hindsight and a lot of people looking back in history, he wasn't the right general to fight Vietnam. And I truly believe that. He fought Vietnam as if it was World War II or, you know, a conventional war. Um, Vietnam was not a conventional war. We learned that when we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, how to fight uh, a guerrilla type warfare. Unfortunately, uh, we, we didn't learn that during the whole Vietnam War. Um, and we tried to take territory, then we would give it up, that territory, and then we'd go back and take the same territory multiple times. Though I was glad I was in Vietnam, I served my country, I did it. Uh, but there was, there was a lot of lessons learned that came out of Vietnam. And when I've talked to soldiers that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, they all talk about all the lessons learned coming out of Vietnam and, and the benefits that they, they've received from that. In this slide, you'll see uh, on, the, on the right is uh, two uh, candle wrappers um, uh, that I, I happened to save and send home uh, at the time to my girlfriend. And then the bottom left was the Christmas card I sent home in December of 68. And the upper left is the, uh, this is a, uh, a ticket, basically. They would drop them from airplanes all through the jungles. You'd be walking in the middle of the jungle and you'd find these laying all over. And on the back of them was like a pay grade scale. It had, that based on your rank, how much money the U.S. government would pay you to defect, and uh, and a lot. Some of those soldiers became what was called Kit Carson scouts, and a, there was a few times where we worked with Kit Carson scouts. A Kit Carson scout uh, was actually in combat on on the North Vietnamese side. A lot of them were North Vietnamese regulars. Now there was two type of combat soldiers in Vietnam. There was the North Vietnamese regulars, which wore regular military uniforms, um, and then there were uh, the South Vietnam uh, guerrilla warfare fighters, and and they tended to be wore the black pajamas and and that that type of uniform, um, and they had different fighting styles. Um, we we engaged in both of those uh, over over the time I was in Vietnam, but. Uh, this, this was a ticket for many of them to convert. Uh, the next slide will show you the comfort of living in Vietnam. If we had two of us bunking, you know, we'd put two ponchos together and we could make a little pup tent. We didn't carry tents. The poncho became everything we needed. In monsoon season, it didn't really much matter because everything was wet and you were just wet for weeks. Dur during the, when, when the monsoon was over, Temperatures would get up to 110, 115, 120. Humidity was extremely high, and we typically carried about 60 to 80 pounds of gear on our back. Um, unlike, I, I mean, Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, or, uh, you know, they, they, they even carry more gear. The, the heavy armor they wear and everything else, I don't know how they, those guys do it. This was my unit. I happened to have a camera with me a Polaroid and I took this picture of the soldiers in my uh, squad and on the far right that was when we were in base which was very free, very seldom uh, uh, we, we would have what was called shit burning details and, and that was we'd have a little little house like little cabin if you would with a couple of holes and some wood and, and that's what we would uh, uh, relieve ourselves in. I probably would s spend in a base out in the field two days out of a month. I mean, that would be about it. Now here, um, this was when I was in boot camp. I just graduated from boot camp. Um, the upper right was my picture from boot camp. And this, this is a picture I took uh, when landing in to what we called a hot LZ landing zone. The uh, we did, we did a lot of that, insertions with helicopters into different areas. 
This is the mountains up in Quezon. We had flown into Quezon a number of times into the mountains. This is what's called a Laws rocket. I fired a bazooka in training, a World War II bazooka, but this is the same thing as the World War II bazooka, only it's a tube short, half that size and it would expand out and it had a rubber trigger, the uh, sight would pop up and you know it was amazing uh, accuracy on those, uh, on those Laws rocket. And I would typically carry at least two of those with me and a couple of claymores. Uh, the claymores were actually like a mine. They were sort of a, uh, a little curved structure to it. You would put it out in front of your line. You'd want to make sure you had a sandbag behind it because, or a tree for the back blast. It had C4 in it. And, and when we needed coffee, we would open it up and take some C4 out and light it. And that would heat our coffee. Uh, it grows, it, it, it gets a real hot blue flame out of it, but there's hundreds of, of little beads in this, in the claymore, and when you set those things off, it really uh, creates some damage. Um, the, there was a burned out, bombed out church, and I, I saved that from the church uh, that was, you know, buried in, in the rubble, uh, and again, this was a candlestick holder that, you know, we periodically buy candlesticks, but only when we were in base. We did, when we were in the field, we did not use candles, nor did you smoke at night or do anything else um, that could attract attention. The next uh, slide is Camp Carroll. Now Camp Carroll, we had a lot of skirmishes day in and day out uh, with the Viet Cong. We would set up ambushes uh, at night. Um, we would go out and do listening posts or, and so on uh, during the day and at night. But uh, Camp Carroll, it was a mountain um, and no North Vietnam was on the other side of the valley facing another mountain. And the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese regulars came in and they took uh, the bridge going up to Camp Carroll and they blew up the bridge. Well, there was a battalion of North Vietnamese regulars that were uh, there. And, and remember, the North Vietnamese fought the French before we got there. So these were hardened soldiers. The North Vietnamese regulars were hardened combat soldiers. Um, they, were, they were not a piece of cake to fight. Um, and we went in with a battalion minus one company uh, up the main road, which was basically a dirt road with a little trenching on the side, um, not much more room than a, a truck going up it. And uh, as we were going up the road, the Viet Cong had that road zeroed in. Uh, the, the mortar rounds, rocket rounds hit us heavy. Uh, the, uh, the units split off uh, going left and right into the brush. Uh, the brush was extremely thick, about five to six feet high. Uh, I stayed on the road and uh, because one of the guys in front of me got wounded, a piece of shrapnel hit his leg and split his leg open. And the corpsman was there and I happened to have the radio that day. So uh, I was call gonna call in the hel uh, helicopter to medevac him out. But uh, the corpsman asked me to go get a stick uh, to hold his leg together. I ran, went across the street, I got across this, this dirt road and I don't know why, but I hit the ditch as soon as I got on the other side of the road and, and a couple of feet from me, a, a mortar round hit, covered me with dirt. And uh, well, then I went back and told the corpsman there was no sticks over there. So, so we proceeded to use his rifle to hold his leg together. We got him medevaced out. Staying on the road ended up working out the best for me because as the units split off, left and right of the road, that's where all the incoming rounds started to go and the road ended up being the, the safest place to be at that time. We, we then went, and the, the, this was a three day, 24 hour a day engagement with, with the Viet Cong. Um, so it, it was that night we set in, we were digging uh, our foxholes and uh, I had picked up jungle rot, so my hand, my left hand, 
was like a club. I couldn't even move my fingertips. It was probably about four times the size of my hand. And trying to dig a foxhole with that was, wasn't easy. Um, so we, uh, but we did, and then the word came down. In fact, our foxhole at the time was only about a foot deep, but because it was hard clay, the word came down that they were gonna be doing arc lighting. And I, th I've heard different terms for this. So basically what it is of the squadron of uh, B-52s that come in and they drop their load at the same time. And what they were doing was hitting North Vietnam on, on their side of the DMZ. Uh, Camp Carroll was right on the DMZ and they dropped it and it was pitch black at night that night and it lit up the light, the sky. I mean, it was like daylight and we were literally bouncing off the ground. Um, the impact, I, I can't imagine if I was any closer. We were probably two miles uh, away from where the bombing was occurring. Maybe, maybe a little closer, maybe a little further. We did a lot of troop movement um, in the helicopters. We had different you know, helicopters. This helicopter, we could get about 40, heli 40 guys in that helicopter easily. You, as you're going into a hot LZ, you sure attract a lot of attention. You, you start seeing rounds uh, going everywhere. Uh, and they go through those helicopters pretty easy. I was there, this is a picture that was taken out of a magazine, Look Magazine. Um, but I was on that mountain and I went up that path, up, up that mountain. I don't know if this was part of our, our unit, it could have been, um, but that's the typical gear you would wear. This, this guy in the lead is, happens to be a machine gunner. The second day we went, we were trying to flank the enemy in, in the valley and we got stuck in an open field for in it, what seemed hours. I don't, I, 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 you lose track of time and those kind of things. Uh, but we had enemy on, on our flanks and we couldn't get out of the field. Um, and there was up on the mountain on the other side of the DMZ, you could see mortar rounds uh, shooting and they would leave a, a tiny white puff of smoke and I could count to 10 and that mortar round would explode somewhere around uh, our, the soldiers in, in our company. Uh, and, and we were there for hours watching that little puff of white smoke before our, our sister unit was able to come in on the flank and get us freed out of that, out of that spot. Um, and, uh, but by the end of the three, three days, it was, uh, uh, we had, piles of weapons uh, that would have filled this room. Uh, and uh, the, the number of Viet Cong killed, I, I never knew what the exact count was, but it was, it was significant. Uh, Quezon, we went into Quezon after the siege. The siege of Quezon lasted 77 days. Uh, the Viet Cong surrounded it. Um, and they tried everything they could to, to take and, and break into that base. Well, Quezon was a huge, huge base. It could accept jets flying into that base. Um, it had, had a big airport, had lots of buildings on that base. Uh, I mean, that was, that was a significant base, up, uh, probably the largest base up in North Vietnam for the, for the U.S. The, the, the Marines held out, that was a Marine base, they held out those 77 days. Well, we came in right after the siege broke and uh, we, uh, we uh, found, you know, the base was just ripped apart. I mean, it was just amazing what had happened to that base. Uh, the trenches that they had there were about five to six feet deep and they zigzagged all the way around the base. So there was miles, literally miles of trenches. And we spent our time in the trenches, uh, you know, at the foxhole or in the bunkers. Well, the, uh, the, there were so many rats that were infiltrated that base, it was amazing. Uh, we, you, you walked down the trench line, you had to have your, your weapon on semi-automatic uh, to shoot the rats. And I had one jump on my back as I was going down the trench line and I jolted forward about five or six feet right into the wall 
and I hit it so hard, the, I knocked the rat right off my back. But at night, we would have to have rat watch uh, in, in the bunkers. When the guys are sleeping, there would be, have to be a guy awake watching so the rats wouldn't start chewing on the other soldiers. Uh, we had one guy in our squad where the rats started chewing his ear away. Um, and uh, so the next morning, we had to medevac him out to get uh, uh, tetanus shots. Uh, so you know, we stayed there three days, and I was glad as hell to get out of that, uh, that place. And we went back up in the mountains. The, the one picture I showed you of, of the mountain, this, this is in the area we were at. Uh, when we first got up in the mountains after a couple days, they couldn't supply us food or, or water. So we went for three days without food. You get pretty silly after three days with no food. We started yelling at the Viet Cong, inviting them up for dinner and stuff, literally. Um, but, uh, and then at night, we would have to sneak out in the front of the lines down the mountain to get to areas where, uh, where we could get water. Now the water, uh, we, you know, and there was, this was a number of cases, we didn't get fresh running water all the time. Uh, but in the bomb craters, there would be um, just all kind of uh, stuff in the water, moss and everything else. You would take your hand, the scum on top of the water, and you would move your arm to move the scum off the top of the water and put your canteen down in it. And then you'd put a halazone tablet in it, and the halazone tablet would, would uh, kill, hopefully, anything that was in that water. You were supposed to let it sit in there for at least 15, 20 minutes before you drank the water. Some guys didn't, and they drank it pretty quick. Well, uh, they, they had a good chance of getting malaria um, or other things. So, um, so that was um, my experience there with, with no food. Um, and uh, finally, the 101st Airborne was able to get in a a pallet of food by helicopter to us in water, oh. and uh, so that w you know we were we were tickled pink with that. It was like they brought us steak dinner. Uh, again, this is pictures of Kason. When I got wounded, the day I got wounded was uh, May 17th. Uh, we were up in the mountains at Kason. We went. Um, it was early, early in the morning. Uh, the sun was just coming up, the fog was real, real heavy, and we're going, we're going to take this one hill, and uh, we, we were a company. We, we got to the base of the hill and we started going up. My squad was going up first, and as we were going up the, the hill, actually we were on top of a mountain, but this was like a little knoll on that mountain. and. Uh, I was on the far left flank. I told the guy in, on my right, I said, you know, to cover my front, and I would watch the left flank. Well, about 15, 20 seconds after I told him that, I heard his rifle go off and turned and seen a Viet Cong fall about 20 feet in front of me. Um, so that, at that point, we started engaging the enemy. We were under heavy fire. Uh, our machine gunner on the far right, for whatever reason, uh, his machine gun jammed, and so we didn't have any suppressing fire. Uh, and uh, as we were returning fire, I noticed about five or six CHICOM grenades. A CHICOM grenade, if you don't know, is like a bowl of st steel, and there's a, a stick that's about an inch in diameter that goes through the top, and it's hollowed out, and it has a fuse in it, and they put uh, TNT or um, C4 or something in the bowl, and they could, they could throw a lot of those at one time by pulling the cords on those. Uh, anyhow, I had a bunch of those coming at me, so I rolled to my left as quick as possible. Uh, it went out, it knocked, knocked me out, and uh, I ended up having some shrapnel wounds in the hips, the neck, or not the neck, the hips, the leg, and my calf, and my heel was split in half. Um, the corpsman pulled me down into a bomb crater, and I sat there. He must have given me morphine because next thing I, which I probably really didn't need, but you know, it knocked me out. And he had brought down another soldier who was shot in the shoulder, 
and he'd given him morphine. Well, our whole squad was wounded or killed. Um, the second squad coming up to get them, uh, most of them were wounded. Um, and the third squad uh, ended up trying to get everybody out. Um, it was later that day when I woke up and I went to the top of the bomb crater and this was probably a, a bo this bomb crater was as big, you could, put a, you could have put a house in it, that's how big this bomb crater was. And I went up to the top and our unit had pulled out. Um, they didn't know we were in that bottom of the bomb crater and so I, I went down to the bottom of the bomb crater, told the, the guy, woke the guy up and said, we got to get out of here. I didn't even know who he was because um, we had gotten resupplied with, with new guys a few days before this engagement, so I, I never even knew the guy's name. Um, so we left, we had to go along a ridge line to get to the other side of, of this valley. And, uh, you know, the Viet Cong, I could see them uh, on the mountain where we were, you know, get, you know, getting their wounded and whatnot, but for, for whatever reason, they never seen us. And uh, so we, we kept walking. It was starting to get dark. I thought we were going to have to spend the night out, uh, you know, and try to find our unit the next day. But as we came around a corner, the next thing I heard was, who goes there? And I think that was my favorite words ever. Um, so we ended up, they, there was a crevice in the ground, and they had all the wounded in that crevice. And uh, we, they had helicopter after helicopter coming in and taking us out. Uh, this, this was during the Tet Offensive uh, still. And they took, us, they took me to four different hospitals before there was room uh, to accept uh, the wounded on that helicopter. Um, be, you know, that's how, how, how bad it was during May of 68, which was, I think, the peak of the Vietnam casualties. Um, this hospital is actually where I had the surgery. You would sit on a bench in front of the operating room tables, about five feet in front of you, and there would be operating room tables as long as this room, and uh, doctors were just working on one guy after the next. The guy next to me happened to be my squad leader, and he, he asked if the bullet went through his arm. The bullet had gone in right here, on, just by the muscle. It went out the back and left a hole the size of a grapefruit. Uh, but I told him it was still in there. I, did, I couldn't tell him he didn't have a back of an arm anymore. Um, so we just, we just sat on the bench waiting to get operated on. Well, I passed out. Next thing I know, they were cutting my clothes off on, on a gurney. And, uh, you know, with the corpsman, I remember saying, as he was taking my boots off, that I didn't have any socks, only the tops. The, the, top, the sock above my shoe or my boot was still there. Uh, the socks inside my boot had all rotted away because uh, we had been on constant move for days uh, and uh, never, had, uh, never had a chance to shave or do anything. Uh, so that was the hospital I uh, got operated on. I spent two days there. Then I went to the hospital ship repos for two weeks, which was nice, clean, white sheets. I, I thought then I should have probably joined the Navy, but um, but the uh, it was it was it was something. There was a hospital ship repos, and then there was the hospital ship. There was two hospital ships. There was also a German hospital ship there off the coast of Vietnam, um, and. Uh, so I spent two weeks on that, uh, on that ship. This picture is when I was still in the rack. A general came by and was pinning Purple Hearts on, uh, I guess it was a goodwill trip or something, on uh, the soldiers. Uh, on there on the right, I was on, in crutches, but I, would, I had managed to get a, a pipe and some tobacco and me and, and that was four other guys in my squad that were on that hospital ship with me. After, after this, I ended up going to Guam. They'd hold about 90 soldiers in, uh, in those. Uh, and that's, you'd have nurses stations and doctors all taking care of you. M my wife 
put a lot of the photos in a book. She did the comments on a lot of my pictures. In Guam, this is a big, huge bay in Guam, and we would, on, uh, on the weekends, uh, we had a, a marine liaison there that would take us on a bus ride, and we'd go around the island someplace and visit something. Well, we were all in our pajamas. Well, I would go, uh, there was a bar over in this area here, um, and I would go through the jungle, and it was about 50 feet of jungle. I mean, it was like dense jungle to get into the bay, and then I'd swim in the bay while, while the other soldiers were having beer. But you could see the pillboxes from World War II. Uh, uh, some places they were every 20 feet. How, how, how they were able to ever take that island with those pillboxes there, and they were, they were like 20 feet off the, off the shoreline. Uh, it's it just amazing. Uh, what the World War II uh, veterans had to go through to, in the islands. Uh, this picture here is Randy Schmidt. I don't know if anybody knows Randy. I know Ralph knows Randy Sch Schmidt. Uh, Randy was wounded in Vietnam also. Actually, once he had a bunker cave in on him from rocket rounds. Uh, he stopped breathing. Uh, they thought he was dead. They were, gonna, they were starting to put him in a bag uh, and then the corpsman seen him move his hand, um, and they were able to revive him in that. Uh, the next time he was shot in the head, uh, and the bullet went around the inside of his helmet, um, but he didn't get wounded uh, severely, and, uh, but they suspect those things is what caused his blindness. He was, he was blind by his 40s. This next slide is some pictures of you know, that Randy took of, of the local villagers and the kids. And kids are kids no matter where you go. This is Haywood Riley. Uh, Haywood Riley is a, a retired sergeant major of the Marine Corps, in the Marine Corps. Uh, he was in Kilo Company, uh, which their slogan is Balls of the Corps. And he met another general, or a general, back a couple years ago and he was all excited because he was telling his lieutenants and, and with him that he's from the balls of the core, you know, so it was a big deal for the general. We had gone down to Paris Island two years ago and met with the base commander down there and we did the parade review uh, for the graduating um, uh, Marines at, at Paris Island. This is some more pictures. This is Haywood Riley here. He's holding the sign up he can't read of his unit. Um, these are some actual pictures of his unit when they were in combat. Um, they had gone over by ship and actually was one of the only units that actually did a, a shore landing by ship. This is again Haywood's unit. Um, what Haywood did, and Haywood had been an instructor for three years uh, for officers uh, down at Quantico. So he had more training than the officers going into um, Vietnam because he trained them all and he did the training over and over and over again. So they never assigned a, an officer to his unit, they just put him in charge. He was a staff, a staff sergeant at, at first and then became gunny. Um, but they set in in an area by a village they had a lot of Viet Cong uh, presence. And so as it was getting dark, he had a couple of guys go scout an area for them to move. And he moved the whole unit. And just after dark, the area that they were set in, in, in was heavily attacked by rocket mortar rounds and everything, and the Viet Cong attacking, um, and they weren't there. Um, they returned fire and were able to get the enemy in a crossfire and ended up having uh, 144 kills that night. Um, so Hay Haywood uh, had an amazing career. He was in the Persian Gulf in his, before he retired as a sergeant major in, in, on board ship. The typical weapons that, the, uh, that they had, um, you could see their mortars. Uh, they were supplied by Korea and China, AK-47s and so on. 
And here's, here's some more of the typical weapons that they had. They didn't have a lot of sophisticated weapons. The RPG here, those are pretty nasty uh, and they're pretty accurate, like our Laws rocket. Did I kill lights? Um, and, uh, you know, the U.S. military, obviously we had a much more sophisticated military equipment, um, but, but we didn't use a lot of tanks. The tanks in a jungle aren't too useful, um, and, or especially in swampy areas. Uh, again, here's some more pictures of uh, some of the military equipment we had. The grenades we had, these were revised from the World War II grenades. They had a much higher killing radius of the old uh, World War II grenades. Uh, we did have a flak jacket, but that was about it over there. Um, uh, but uh, not, not anything like what the soldiers have today, thank goodness. And then there's artwork. You know, after um, the war, a lot of soldiers that had the, the capabilities, there, you could find a lot of artwork done uh, by uh, Vietnam soldiers. You know, it's amazing the talent, but you see, you see the things that they draw, and some of them are pretty uh, descriptive. And these are just some samples. One thing that's very interesting, though, is, is uh, Mike McGrath. Uh, he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. I believe it was like six years. What he did when he got out of uh, being a prisoner of war, he, you could see he drew art and described what his uh, prison was like for him in, in that prisoner of war. And you can see by some of the pictures, you know, the tough times uh, those soldiers went through. Now, most of the time, if a, an enlisted man was captured in Vietnam, they weren't kept. The, the officers was what was the prize. If you were enlisted and captured, you, you, you know, you were dead. And then here's, here's some more uh, combat art. But this one is PTSD. And you can see the gruesome picture of PTSD. Well, World War I, Korea, World War II, you know, none of the prior wars knew what PTSD was, neither did Vietnam. Um, they didn't come up with PTSD until probably about 25 years after Vietnam. Um, I had PTSD uh, for a long time. My, my wife and I would go to bed at night, and I'd go to sleep, and then she'd get out of bed because she was scared of me at night with the thrashing I would do. I almost broke her arm one night. Um, so, and you know, uh, I never got more than three or four hours sleep. Even today I don't get, uh, you know, if I get five, six hours sleep, I'm doing phenomenal. Um, so it just, it just, you know, when we were in Vietnam, you would, you would be on guard one hour, sleep an hour, sometimes on guard two hours, sleep an hour, and, and you know, after long periods of that, doing that, you know, it just, it, you know, it ruined uh, your sleep for many of us. But you can, you can see the, the pictures that uh, are in the minds of some of the, uh, the soldiers that have PTSD. I uh, have, have seen and talked with and worked with a number of soldiers of recent years uh, that have PTSD. I can tell you that the VA hospital has a phenomenal program treating PTSD um, and uh, they, they have a 13-week pro, uh, program where the soldier actually lives at the hospital with other soldiers that have PTSD and there's a number of women soldiers that have PTSD that I've met. In fact, um, Medina County, the last couple sessions where they've had programs with, with the women PTSD, uh, we've, we've supplied lunches for them every, every day they meet uh, from Medina. Um, so the, uh, uh, but the PTSD, basically the program they have 
is they require the vet, they, they basically force the vet to relive his experiences over and over and over again. And when they start doing it, it's tears, it's sweat, it's, I mean, but they, they force them to go over. And what they're trying to do is desensitize you to the events that, that you endured. Um, and uh, it even works, and I know it's worked for Vietnam vets, you know, 30, uh, 40 years, 50 years later, that still had PTSD. Now for me, after a couple of years, my PTSD sort of uh, subsided quite a bit, but I remember the first talk I gave on, on uh, or well, I didn't give a talk, I was actually at dinner. Uh, my cousin was in the Air Force in Vietnam, uh, he had, in the canine, and uh, he was talking about his experiences, and I started to say something, the next thing I know, they were shaking me because I was in a total trance and, and my body was soaking wet. So, but it took a couple of years. My wife and I got married. When I came back to the States from Guam, I was at the Bethesda Naval Hospital for a couple of months, and that's when my wife and I got married. And we just had our 50th wedding anniversary, August 3rd. So she's managed to put up with me all these years. This slide shows you um, the number of deaths. So if you look at 1968, there was almost 17,000 soldiers killed in Vietnam. 67 and, and, and 69 also were heavy combat. So, so during that three year period um, was the, the most significant engagement with the Vietnam War for, for the combat soldier. I was doing business, when I got out of the service, um, I wasn't especially a good student in school. I, I was probably a C average at best because school never really interests me as, as a young kid. Uh, my dad died when I was 15, so I went to work full time. So I never went to school. Uh, the latest I went to school was noon. Um, and so when I got out of school, actually March, before I graduated, I went and joined, enlisted in the Marine Corps. And uh, at that time, my ma was, had remarried and uh, she blamed my stepfather on me going in. Um, and, but it wasn't him that did it. He was a great guy. Uh, but so I, I went in, I figured I was tired of working, you know, if I didn't need to work anymore at home for the family. And uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, the motivation, and one of the statistics they have for those that served in Vietnam was they had the lowest unemployment rate, uh, the highest earn, uh, average uh, wage earners of any of the other uh, comparative people in, in, in the popu general population. Um, I became uh, director of information technology for two companies and vice president of information for another. Um, I ran $100 million projects and uh, you know that, uh, that motivation came out of the Marine Corps. Um, so the Marine Corps gave me a lot. It takes a lot out of you, but it sure the hell gave me a lot. And uh, I never regret the service I did. Um, and I still honor all those that do and, and would do anything for our veterans. And I do a lot of fundraisers with a lot of great guys uh, to help veterans. Uh, we've had veterans that needed housing or different things, and we do what we can to help make it comfortable for them. Uh, but you can see the impacts on, the Viet on Vietnam with, in Ohio. Uh, then, you know, there's different, the Three Soldiers Monument in Washington, D.C., and what I was going to say earlier was I was doing business down in, in D.C. a lot, flying down there, and uh, I could never bring myself to go to the Vietnam Memorial. And uh, it was probably at least 25 years, maybe a little longer, that I went to the wall. And it was the hardest thing I ever did. I mean, it, was, it, just, it just broke me up. Um, and uh, um, 
so it, it's, it's a long road sometimes to recovery, but you, you do it a little at a time. The next slide is the Vietnam Wall. I did a lot of talking. Any questions or? Um, I'm going to ask your age, and based on your response, I need to ask a question. How old are you? S 70. 70. Then you might not have seen the World War II series victory at sea. I have. Oh, you have? A long time ago. Before you went in the Marines? Oh, gosh. I couldn't say no. Okay, then my question is this. Assuming that you knew there were five branches of the armed forces and you decided to go in, why did you select the Marines? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know if I really had a, a, a really thought it out much. I, I decided I wanted to go in the military. The Navy I knew was uh, the wait was a lot longer to try and get into the Navy, and the Navy at the time, uh, at the end of, in, in, or around March, April of 67, was very difficult to get in the Navy. Um, and uh, so I, I took, uh, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't want to choose the Army. I decided I'd go with the Marines, and I knew a couple of guys uh, earlier that had gone, you know, the year before that had gone in the Marine Corps, so I, I just took that, that step. Yes, sir. I believe you mentioned that the Tet Offensive, uh, that we didn't lose, like, we weren't beaten in the, in the Tet, Tet Offensive. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, that's a good point. Uh, Tet Offensive, it was, it was basically Every combat base in South Vietnam was attacked by the uh, North Vietnamese Regular Army and uh, the guerrilla warfare, uh, the guerrillas. And uh, we, we won every combat engagement in South Vietnam in all those, and there was hundreds of bases that they attacked. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, Way was one of the worst. Quezon and Way were the two heaviest engagements. Way, if you don't know, was considered before the Vietnam War the Pearl of the Orient. It had probably the best university in the Orient in Way. Um, it had a huge military school there and, and everything else, but um, every, every one of those engagements they lost. Uh, at the, what, what Ho Chi Minh, or what his, his his predecessors that took over for him uh, were looking for was for the South to stand up and fight with the North. Well, that never happened. Uh, so they were, they were on their own. Well, the, the North Vietnamese regular military was basically decimated. Uh, they, they, were, they were pretty much wiped out, um, as well as the guerrillas in the South. The, it took when we pulled out in 73, and this is, this is in uh, 68, uh, when, when the Tet Offensive occurred, January 30th of 68, which is a religious holiday, and uh, it lasts 30 days. And, and, and after that period, they were, they were, they were and that uh, Tet Offensive lasted, I think, four months. Uh, don't hold me to that, but it was pretty close to that. Uh, the uh, case on lasted 77 days, and uh, uh, so it took until till 1975 for that army, the North Vietnamese Army, to rebuild itself to come back and take South Vietnam, and they did it. We left South Vietnam in '73. The whole country was under control. Uh, the South Vietnamese Army. Uh, was uh, in, in relatively good shape at that point. And we had a peace agreement, a Paris peace agreement, that, that everything was, which North Vietnam uh, broke the peace agreement in 75. Um, but it, it took them that long to rebuild their military to be able to come back down to take. But the issue was, because Westmoreland kept saying, we're winning the war, we're winning the war. And when the Tet Offensive happened, 
Um, it, was, it was the greatest move the North Vietnamese could have done because it showed to the American people the war's not over, we're not winning, and that was the view, and that's what the news reporters were, were, were signaling. And, uh, and as a result, more and more people were against the war, and we were forced out of, of Vietnam, which ended up, though, when we left, and, and the North came down and take, took over the South, they had lists of names of those that were sympathizers. And there was, they don't know how many were killed, but tens of thousands of people that were sympathizers with the U.S. were, were slaughtered. That's what happens when you pull out of a war before it's over. Yes, sir. I had a young friend that died of Agent Orange. Would you mention Agent Orange? Yes, sir. Um, um, I, Agent Orange, there's, there's a number of uh, what they call presumptive uh, conditions that automatically are a Agent Orange related. Um, there's one that's heart. Uh, if you had a heart attack or certain heart conditions, uh, they've proven that that can be caused by Agent Orange. Uh, I've had prostate cancer, and prostate cancer is uh, a presumptive uh, with uh, Agent Orange. Uh, they would spray Agent Orange all over the place. We'd get sprayed with it, you know, it'd just be everywhere. Uh, it'd be in the water you drink. Um, but not everybody got Agent Orange, but quite a few people did. Uh, there's, a, there's a, I think, about 10 or 11 things that are classified as presumptive illnesses uh, that qualify you as Agent Orange and as a result uh, can receive a disability from the VA. And Ed Zachary, who heads up the VSO office, how many are veterans in here? Quite a few. Uh, does, does everybody know what the VSO office is? The VSO is the Veterans Service Office. Ed Zachary is the director of the VSO office. He has a staff of about five people, I think. He is responsible for all, then there's about 13,000 veterans in Medina County, and he's responsible for all those veterans. And anybody that needs help or thinks they have a condition that might be covered by the VA, uh, or if they have, we've had veterans um, that weren't combat vets, but couldn't pay their rent or a variety of conditions, needed a wheelchair, we make sure those things get taken care of. Um, but, but Ed Zachary, he is paid by the county. He, he works, he has three, um, no, four veterans uh, that are head of his commission that he reports to, so it's four veterans in, in, our, in the county um, that are appointed and reviewed by the judge and, and a few other people um, as, as, uh, as the VSO is set up. And the VSO, ha they have a lot of training they have to go through and certification they have to do uh, to be able to service the veterans and make sure the veterans are getting the right thing. And Ed, Ed will fight for the veteran. Yes, sir. At your level as a corporal, did you sense there was a real purpose in the Vietnam War, or could you sense the futility of some of the things that we were <coughs> engaged with, particularly being with rules of engagement? Well, the rules of engagement where I was at up north, the North Vietnam, we, we didn't have really rules of engagement um, like the South did. If you were the Army fighting in the South, you had a lot of rules of engagement for engaging the enemy. We, we, we had very few of that. Um, but as far as, you know, I was over there to do a job when I went there. I was trained and, you know, you, I didn't think much about the war other than, you know, I knew we were there to hold communism and to help free South Vietnam. That was the extent of my knowledge at that point. But years later, as you look at it, 
and you look at the fall of Russia and other things, you know, I don't think the U.S. is smart enough, nor any government is smart enough, but it was, it was, it's like a chess game out there, you know, uh, and, you know, you've got things going on now with Iran, for instance, and others, you know, that, you know, if you, if you let them take an inch, they'll take a mile, and they'll try to take over this country or that country, or, you know, and the next thing you know, you got a Germany going on, and, and you got World War II. So where do you stop things? And that's the way I view it. You know, sooner or later, you have to draw the line, and you have to stop it. Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, during the monsoon season, you went for weeks and weeks and weeks with everything being wet, including you. Well, do you have any thoughts on the long-term health effects of that? I mean, it seems like it would be conducive to all kinds of diseases and medical problems. Well, other than, um, you know, trying to keep your feet dry, uh, the rest of you wasn't so important. You didn't want to get foot rot. That was the worst thing you could get as a soldier, a foot soldier. Um, and you did everything you could to keep your feet dry. But, um, but you know, it, it's funny, you know, once you got in country by the first, after the first few days or week, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, it, it just, you were living there. That was, you know, you didn't think anything of it. And I think partly was because you were so damn tired, you, did, you couldn't think of anything else anyhow. Yes, sir. Jack, your impression of the wall. <clears throat> I was there. I was impressed also. Mine was the Korean display, but the wall was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. It took you right there. It did. I, I, I mean, that slope down downward it just it was just chilling i mean i i would just in tears so bad i i i, I could hardly breathe yes sir it just seemed like those helicopters seemed vulnerable did you lose a lot of helicopters over there oh yeah yeah we did we had a lot of helicopters uh, shot down um we would periodically we'd get a call that a, a, a helicopter or a jet went down and we would, we would literally um, take our canteen and ammo and rifle and, and, and we would run for miles and miles um, to get to the point where we could, um, you know, protect the, the landing craft when it came down uh, and the soldiers that, you know, and, and bring them uh, aid. That, that to answer that, yeah, the the helicopters. You know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be a, those helicopter pilots when I was on the ground and we were in fighting the you know the Viet Cong and we had wounded to get out, and you got a helicopter flying in to you know rocket rounds and uh, you know machine gun fire and everything else, and those guys are bringing in their helicopter to get the wounded out. I mean, those guys had a lot of guts. You know, when I, when I got wounded and I was laying on the ground when I hit the ground, I had a little bush about a foot high. <laughs> that was the extent of my cover. But I, I, I thought that was the best cover I could have at the time. But the helicopter pilots, they had no cover. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Token of our appreciation. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Yeah.